So now we'll go through a few simple examples of how to write some Verilog code. So every programming language has to start with hello world. So let's write our first Verilog module. So this is a complete Verilog program. It doesn't do anything, but uh, we have to show it anyway. So module, and we called it main. Um, and then there's an end module that goes with the, the main module. And then we have initial. So this is behavioral code. This is non-synthesizable. So it can have an initial, which means it starts at uh, the zero time of the simulation. We have a begin to end block. And inside we have these two system calls. One says display it prints out hello world. And the other one says finish to tell the simulator that we've reached the end of the simulation. So that's your kind of first uh, very uh, uh, do nothing very log code that writes out hello world. Of course, you would never do that, but um, let's see some practical examples of how to write RTL. So combinat combinatorial combinational logic. We have three different ways, or there's probably more than that, to write a mux, uh, but let's just show, show them to you as examples. So we can start with an assigned statement. So in a signed statement, we declare somewhere up above a wire called out. And then as we saw before, we can use this ternary operator. We say assign, then the name of the wire out equals the name of the selector, um, which is also probably a wire. Is it a one? If yes, then return, then connect it to an A. If not, then connect it to a B. And again, this um, just makes this mux where we have a hardwired A and B signals that were declared somewhere out, which is declared as a wire, and this selector, which is also declared somewhere above. So that's what it does. It makes this hard wire to sign. It's just basically a wire that goes through. Okay, we can do it using an always block. And again, this is gonna be the exact same thing. It's gonna infer the same uh, multiplexer. So here we actually describe the output as a reg. Okay, so uh, you can kind of get the idea that assigns uh, they output wires. On the other hand, regs uh, are used to output always blocks. So here we have always at, and we have in the sensitive sensitivity list A or B or cell. Of course, we could have not written that and written always at star, and it would have done the same thing, and it's a better practice to do that. Then we ask if cell, if cell equals one, then out gets A else out gets b and remember this is a combinatorial block or a combinational block and therefore we use a blocking assignment this is a blocking assignment okay only a blocking assignment um, another thing you have to make sure in a combinational block that every if has an else in other words that if we have on the left hand side some signal which is the out then we better know what to do with it if we don't meet the, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this condition. Because if we don't meet the condition, let's say we didn't have this else. We say if cell out equals A, but what happens if not cell? Then we have to keep the same state and that would infer a latch and that's a big no-no or it's not what we wanted to do probably. Okay, so that is gonna make the same exact mux, just using an always block. A third way would be to use an always block, but use a case statement, which we saw before. So again, since it's an always block, we'll use um, a reg to describe our out signal. And this time we'll again have our always at our uh, sensitivity list. We have uh, a case. We didn't actually need the begin and end because um, it's only one uh, instruction inside, but we say case cell. What's the status of cell? If it's zero, then out equals B. If it's one, out equals A. And again, we use blocking assignment. So these are just three examples of how we can write the same code. And we kind of showed the difference between a reg and a wire, which we'll get to as a, as a real rule of thumb in a second. Let's see some sequential logic. So we already went through similar examples before, but let's say a simple D flip-flop. So here again, to show the output, we use a declaration of a reg, so Q is a reg, and we say always at pause edge clock, Q non-blocking uh, non gets D. So that makes a flip-flop. It gets a signal clock over here. It gets a signal D over here. It gets a signal Q over here, and we have a D flip-flop. No reset, no enable, no nothing. Then we have an asynchronous reset D flip-flop. So this will have a reset signal and it will have an, it will be an asynchronous reset. So again, the output we describe as a reg and then we say always at 
posage clock or negage reset underscore and I'm purposely showing you different notation for how to show a signal that is normally uh, high and, and operated at low. So we before we had n reset like a negative reset here we have reset underscore which shows reset but it's kind of like should be low. We can have reset bar reset b. Uh, well there are different ways of writing that so I'm, purposely I'm showing you different ways of calling your signals. So pause edge clock or neg edge reset. In other words, we will go into this always block e either when the clock rises or when reset goes down. We don't have to wait for clock to rise once a reset is applied. That's why it's an asynchronous reset. It does, it's not synchronized to the clock. We push the reset button, it, auto, it happens immediately. And then we say if not reset. And before we use the bang uh, exclamation point, it's the same in this case is using this inversion operator, a tilde. Okay, so so if not reset, Q gets zero, else Q gets D, and what we have here again is a flip-flop that gets a clock here, but it also has this reset underscore here, um, which is the reset, and it has this D and this Q. Okay, so that's an asynchronous uh, D flip-flop, asynchronous reset, um, and just something very important. If you want to describe a latch, what you would do is again use this reg Q. And look, you don't have a clock here. You have an enable. It could be a clock, but it's it's a latch clock. It's a level sensitive. There's no pause edge or neg edge uh, keyword over here. It's always at enable. Whenever enable changes, we go into this block. And it says if enable, if enable is high, then Q equals D. But there's no else. Okay? What happens if enable is low? We have to save the state we had before. Okay, so that is exactly a latch. So at, here we have D and we have Q, and we have this clock here, which is a um, level sensitive pause edge clock or a pause edge enable signal. So when enable is high, D passes over to Q. When enable is low, um, we keep what was ever sampled before at Q. So that that infers a latch, and you'll see if we do not have this else. Uh, and we don't account for every possible um, possible um, uh, action that happened on enable, then Q will have to be latched. And that's something we often don't want to do. It happens by mistake. Our next thing is just a short discussion of arithmetic. There have been many books and papers written about arithmetic in, in hardware description languages, but it's kind of easy in Verilog 2001 until you start getting into the tricks. So. It supports basic arithmetic operators like a plus, minus, to add, to subtract, and you can do it on uh, on multiple uh, bit vectors. You can do multiplication. You can do a shift left or a shift right, and there are other types of operators such as that. Division, not so fast. Um, division is more complicated when you want to do it in hardware, so don't just write a division operator. Okay, you can do this concatenation. If I want to connect two, two buses together, two wires together of multiple bits, I use this um, curly braces and then a comma between them. So for example, if I have a sign A equals uh, 1100, a sign B equals 1011, when I want to concatenate them together, I use this concatenation operator, curly braces and comma A, B, a, B and C will get 11001010. So that's something that's done quite often. Okay. Um, by default, Verilog treats all vectors as unsigned binary numbers. Okay. They're unsigned binary numbers. Okay. To make them signed, to turn them into two's complement signed numbers, what we have to do is declare them with the word signed. So we do wire signed, the vector width, A and B, wire signed, the vector width, result, we can already instantiate it with the um, uh, multiplication of A and B and keep it all signed, okay? If we want a signed constant, we have to add this S before um, the type of encoding we're doing afterwards. So 10SH37C will have a signed number 37C. Now, the big question of reg 
versus wire. And uh, I say, oh no, don't go there because this is the worst thing that they actually ever did in this Verilog language. And they had some great idea which kind of went uh, wrong. So a reg is not necessarily an actual register. As you saw, we often have just a regular wire that is an accombinatorial uh, type of, a, a, of a, an expression be called a reg. It's a driving signal, whatever that is supposed to be. It's very ridiculous, um, and if you do the wrong um, declaration, then the compiler will complain, but basically it won't be a bug. But just so we don't have these complaints from the compiler, which we um, will scratch our head on what we should do to fix it, just follow these pretty easy um, rules. So inside always blocks, either sequential or combinational, just as long as there's an always block, the left-hand side is only a reg, so here. We have an always at star r is a and b. r is on the left hand side. That means r is a reg. Okay. On the other hand, for an assigned statement, the left hand side is only a wire. Okay. So we have a sign w equals a and b. Does exactly the same thing as this does. But since we use an assign, the left hand side should be a wire. Okay. An initial block in a test bench. On the left hand side, it's always a reg. This is a driving signal, I guess. Okay, so initial begin, R gets zero. A delay of one time unit, R gets one. R has to be declared as a reg. Okay, the output of an instantiated module can only connect to a wire. So you can never connect the output of an instantiation to a reg. Okay, so we have this module called M1 and it has some sort of output called out, okay? And then we have in a, in a different module, we are instantiated. So we say M1, here's an instance of M1 dot out, and we connect it to R. If we declared R as a reg, we're gonna get an error. So never do that. We'd have to, right here, wire and everything would be okay. All right, and last but not least, the inputs of a module cannot be a reg. Okay, so I have module M2 and it has an input. We declared it as input in. We cannot write reg in. We can write wire. Wire is uh, implicit, so we don't need to write wire. Um, we just write input in. Okay. Now, how about a test bench? We need to make a test bench to check our RTL code, which basically you surprisingly know how to write already after these few minutes of, uh, of lecture. And, but we need to make a test bench. So the basic thing we need in a test bench of any sequential system is a clock. So how do we do that? So we have something here called a macro where, uh, that I'm showing you for the first time. So this back apostrophe uh, define clock period 10. What happens is when the compiler goes through the code, it will look for the word clock, the string clock period, and it finds it here. It will erase it and replace it with 10. That's a macro that replaces um, some of the text inside the file. It's very common to use this. You can use either these macros or you can use parameters, which uh, they have different reasons for using them, but basically in the end they do the same thing. Okay, then we have initial because our test bench will start at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the simulation run and our clock should be uh, initialized. So we write clock equals zero. Um, Clock had to obviously be defined as a reg somewhere. Had to be reg clock over here, or else it wasn't gonna work. Okay, and then we write always without any um, any sensitivity list. This is just gonna happen over and over and over again. This thing is a delay. Okay, it's a delay. So we delay by whatever comes after it. Whatever comes after it is. 10 divided by 2. So we delay by 5 time steps and then clock gets not clock. So every 5 time steps, we start with clock equals 0. That's 5 time steps. Then clock goes up to 1. 5 time steps, clock goes down to 0. So we got a clock with a period of 10 or a frequency of 1 over 10. So that's going to be how we uh, make a clock in a test bench.